In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Make the pure light of thy truth to shine in our hearts. The Master who loves mankind, grants to pursue a spiritual and godly life, and help us in the way we should go. Teach us your holy will always, now and forever, to the ages of ages. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So I want to I wanted to do a class which I can post in fact, uh, which is good for people who couldn't be here today, and it's called um, the tw Twelve Distinctives of the Orthodox Church. What's a distinctive? It's okay if you don't know. That's why you're here. Often when people talk about denominations, so give me a name of the denomination. A, a Christian denomination? Lutheran. Lutheran, okay. Another one? Oh, a spotlight. Calvary Chapel, for example, right? Um, Episcopal. Adventist. Methodist. Baptist. Right? Pentecostal. Adventist. Pentecostal. Evangelical. Yeah. Um, let me think about uh, this one called, um, anyways, you know, Foursquare. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Those are called denominations. And each one, though they claim to be not denomination, isn't a denomination, obviously. And they have a distinctive, sometimes more than one distinctive. So, if you meet someone and he says, well, I'm, I'm, I'm just a Christian, I'm non-denominational. You can ask, does your church baptize infants? The answer is no, they belong to the Baptist family of denominations. Baptists don't baptize infants. Um, if they practice for everyone and kind of expect the gift of tongues, then they're Pentecostal. Right? If it's deemed to be something that may exist but is not um, particularly emphasized, then they're not Pentecostal. Right? So distinctives are teachings that are make a group distinct from another group. Right? So in this room we have tables, the round tables, and maybe in this family, called the Anabaptist Baptist group, right? These are Christian groups that don't baptize infants, right? So the Baptists, the Baptists, the Mennonites, and uh, Amish, and all evangelicals don't. But here in this group, you have churches that do baptize infants. For example, you're going to have Lutherans, the Episcopal Church, the Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church. Okay, so. So my question, to an extent, is what are the, the distinctive teachings of the Orthodox Church? And maybe by giving you this, I can then make a contrast with those who disagree. Right. So uh, where do I start? I would say that when I say Orthodox Church, I use a term I don't like. Why is that? Hot water. It's okay. It's either hot water or nuclear uh, uh, emergency. Uh, <laughs> water. So, so I don't really like the term Orthodox Church. Why is that? Maybe you like it. I don't. Or Eastern Orthodox Church. Or Greek Orthodox Church. Or any of those. I don't like any of them. Yes, one church. That's true. That is a good answer. Though it doesn't explain why I dislike the term <laughs> Orthodox Church. I mean, it's, it's not a bad term. It works, right? I just don't like it. Why? Because historically, these adjectives, Orthodox and Catholic, they are very precise. So historically, it's the Orthodox faith, and it's the Catholic Church. Right? And then over the centuries, we've, gone, we've been jumbling this, and now there's the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church. Right. But historically, during the first centuries, the church was Catholic and the faith was Orthodox. And the two are different things, aren't they? Church makes reference to a structure, an organization, right. with historical connections. Whereas faith is about what you believe. So, I'll give you an example. That happened here, in fact. Right. A long time ago, came a man on a track. Remember that song? Dice Trace, Telegraph Road? 
a long time ago, and a man on a track, walking 30 miles with a sack on his back. Anyways, it, it's what happened here. A man arrived, and he had the Orthodox faith and the liturgy, right? So the way to baptize, the way to do the, the, the worship, the Eucharist. And he taught all of that to people here, perfectly fine overall. But he was never attached to the church. He just kind of went online, uh, get ordained online for $25 and <coughs> certificates. Uh, and you show up and you have certificates. It's not the Orthodox Church. It's just some, some people out there that are pretending to be. And that happens, it happened to me last week. I spoke with someone in Africa trying to help a group of people. I said, are you Orthodox? He, uh, yeah, I was okay. I was okay. Unclear. Who's your bishop? That was my question. Well, we're uh, kind of under Bartholomew. So I know you're in Africa. Mm -hmm. You can be under Bartholomew, right? Because he's in Turkey. So I wrote to the bishop of the of the area called Metropolis. I said, "Do you know these people?" The answer was, "No." No. Huh? So there's the, the structure of the church, which is this historical lineage, basically. Right, it's a structure from the apostles. So Christ chooses 12 apostles. It, it says to be with him. I kind of like that person. Just to be with him. We all need people to hang out with. So Jesus said, I need people to be with. 12 apostles. They also represent the new Israel. The 12 tribes, the 12 patriarchs. And he ordained them. In the scriptures, how does he do that? How does he ordain the apostles? Well, he chooses them. They're called apostles, right? And they're uniquely with him at the Last Supper. And he tells them, do this. It's a commandment. Do this to remember me. Right? And so they are chosen. Then he blows on them. And he says, to whomever sins you retain, they are retained. So Christ commissions these 12 men. And among them, there's a special apostle who is... Peter. Who's Peter? Peter is called in Greek as always Protos Petros. And that means Protos means first, like a prototype. Uh, Petros means Peter. First Peter. So among the apostles, one is the chief apostle, Peter. Hierarchy. So the Orthodox Church, unlike most modern Christians, except for Roman Catholics, to be frank, really think that church is very important. Sure, what you believe is important. It's true. But the structure you belong to is very important. I'll give you an example, and Mark can relate to that. Say you want to go to Israel to live. Now, you could go to the embassy, but there's a line. People aren't always friendly. There's a fee. Say, I don't need to go to the embassy to get a visa. I'll go to the local Jewish deli. <laughs> they're really friendly, the food is great, and they put a rubber stamp, you know, the Stein New York Deli on your passport, and you arrive in Jerusalem, will they accept the stamp from the Stein Jewish Deli? No, they will not. Because the government has appointed embassies and consulates, right? there's a structure that exists that is the normative way to get things done. That's exactly the way the Orthodox faith understands the Catholic Church. Because uh, think about it, every Sunday we confess the core of the Orthodox faith in the Creed. Right? I believe in one God the Father Almighty. And then we confess, we believe in one holy Catholic Apostolic Church. What does that mean? What does the word Catholic mean? Take a look. Mm -hmm. Where does it come from? In fact, uh, in our official documents, uh, we tend to call ourselves the Orthodox Catholic Church, if we have to give a name, right? Um, what, so the word Catholic is from where? It's in the Bible, right? You ever, ever seen it in the Bible? 
this from one of the church fathers. Right, so if you read an English Bible, because you don't read Greek well enough, but we're going to work on that, you won't see it. But if you read the Bible in Greek, you will see it. So it's in Acts 9.31. And I will read to just two, uh, two texts. So Acts 9. See, a distinctive is that we don't always bring our Bible, but we should. That would be one of the, the distinctives too. We should, uh, the computer should have, should have it, at least the iPhone. It says, um, Acts 9.31, Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Did you catch the word Catholic in here? Because it's in English, so you didn't. But the Greek says the Ecclesia Catholis. Right? That's the term in Greek, right? It means, it means this. It's very simple, really. It means the church has a feature from God, which is that when it is present in any given city, so this is, for example, Jerusalem, it has its bishop, its presbyters, its deacons and helpers, and the people gathered around. It has the bread and the cup. The whole church is there. It's not a part of the church. It's not a portion. The whole is here. Now, our brain, as it was, doesn't work that way. No, that can't be. You can have the whole thing here and the whole thing here, and surely they have to be part of a bigger whole. The answer is no in the Bible, right? There is no. That's why the, the, trans, the translation that we have here is churches, not the churches throughout Judea. How can you have churches and we confess that there is one church? Which one is it? Is there one or is there many? So the answer is there is one church because Christ has one body. And the one church exists at one level as all believers that have ever lived, will ever live anywhere in the world, anywhere in time. That's the body of Christ. But that's the transcendent you know, church, the one church. But it has a property which is called Catholicism. Whenever it's manifested in a particular place, it's whole and complete. So the head of the church is Christ. Yes, in the eternal sphere, right? With with all Christians that ever lived, but in a particular place, it is who's the head of the, of the church? The the visible is the bishop. The bishop is Peter, mm -hmm. and that's the orthodox ecclesiology. Who is Peter's successor? or visible presence, who is the chief rabbi with power to bind and loose, to make rabbinical decisions for the family, it's the bishop. Right? So you can see that the distinctive is that the church is very important. You have to be in the church because you have to go to the embassy the Lord established to get your visa to go to the holy land of heaven. Right? It's very tempting to say, you know, the church bothers me, the priest isn't nice, the bishop is Greek, or whatever the reason is. So I'd rather set up my own, my own group. So I always tell people when they call, and it makes some people uh, unhappy, I had a bumper sticker, people didn't like it, it says, not a church, the church. People call me, I'm looking for a church. Looking for a church? You're looking for the church. Otherwise, you're shopping for features, the program, you know. You know. In, in every place, normally, not always, there is the church. Just like, you know, you want to go somewhere, you go to the embassy. It's been appointed through a process. What's the process? Well, in fact, to Jerusalem, and uh, since we have an ambassador of Jerusalem, it's a good place to start, right? The Lord, the risen Lord, it is said, uh, appears 
appears to the apostles and he commands, he orders Peter, James and John, them three, to make, to ordain is the term, James, the brother of Jesus, that is in fact son of Joseph, not of Mary, okay, by previous marriage, to make this James, who's about 50 years old at the time, 55, the Bishop of Jerusalem. The apostles never become bishops anywhere, but the Lord commands that these three apostles ordain James as the first Bishop of Jerusalem. So that's the first church, the mother church, as we call it in some of our songs. Holy Zion is Jerusalem, Bishop is James. He's got presbyters, Eucharist, and then later on, there's another town where there's a church. Which one is it? Where they're first called Christians. It says there were Christians who were first called Christians in, in Antioch. In Antioch, it will be likewise, right? That this is the whole church, right? There will be the whole church. In Rome, it's going to be the whole church. In fact, uh, when when Saint Paul writes to the Romans, chapter six, he says, "Greet the whole church." The whole church is there. So that's a, that's an Eastern concept. It's very hard for Westerners. Westerners with the Roman Latin might say, "No, no, no. All of these things." Together form the one church. It has to have one boss, and that boss is going to be the Pope, who is really Peter, who really is the only bishop. So you have this pyramid, and they, when you read the Catechism of the Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church, it says every, every diocese is a portion of the church. But we would say, it, it, to be really precise now, Every diocese is the whole church. So sometimes people say, aren't you bothered about what's happening in Jerusalem with the patriarch, the selling land, whatever it is? Like, well, I mean, a little bit, but the whole church for me is here. Right? It's our bishop, it's our diocese, it's our point. That's the whole church. Everything we need. Now, obviously, it's true, and that's the beauty, is that every local church, every whole church, is in communion with the neighboring churches. And they have to be because how many apostles did Jesus need to make James the bishop? Or choose? Three, right? Peter, James, and John. So that was the pattern. It takes three bishops to come to, the, to a, a, a city where the bishop is, is, is dead to replace him. That's the rule. That's another distinctive, I would say, in the Roman Catholic Church, a bishop can make a bishop. The Pope can make a bishop. In the Orthodox Church, no. You need to have three neighboring bishops. So there is both this, the, the, the cell is whole, and yet it's connected to an organism all throughout the world. So sometimes you will have the church which is in Carthage, the church which is somewhere else, disagree. Read at the history. Here they want to do baptize on the eighth day, they want to baptize on the fortieth day. It doesn't really matter. Sometimes they, you know. So every church will have unique features. So I want you to remember this, the Orthodox faith, which we confess on Sunday, the creed. But as part of it, we confess that we believe in the church. So you can't really separate right, the Orthodox faith and the Catholic Church. They're inseparable. Okay. Now, the faith is important. I think an accurate faith is important. Uh, St. Paul writes that there are those who were teaching that the resurrection has taken place already. Is that true? No, it's a false, false doctrine. And therefore, they have made shipwreck of their faith. Shipwreck of their faith. So false doctrine is a, is, is a problem. All right, so I've covered this really awful, just one distinctive, uh, which is that sense of Orthodox faith, Catholic Church. Right? The ecclesiology, the Orthodox Church, is unique. It's unique. We don't have a pope. We have bishops. We have presbyters, priests, that are of married men. We don't have women that are presbyters. Right? Uh, we have deacons. 
and then I'll continue to the list. I mean, we so that's a unique feature. That's a unique feature. Right, right, right there. And the purpose of this, uh, of the church, is what? What, what? what is the church supposed to be doing? By the way, you know, when you go to a company like on Verizon, it says our mission is to provide great service to people. With their, you know, what's our mission here? As church. Worship God. It is that's something we do. And it's not incorrect. But what is the what why does the church exist? The church exists, of course, to glorify God, but to accomplish his, his holy will, which is to unite people to Jesus Christ. What we do. Because that's how you're saved. Everything that's outside of Christ's life perishes. So either we're joined to Christ was the power for mortal life, or you're not and you're perishing with the elements of the world. So that's what we do here. The liturgy, that's why on think about it a distinct table, okay, but how many churches now don't even have a Eucharist on Sunday? Very many. So another distinctive, which I think is very unique, is, is, is the view of the Trinity that we have. But when people come to an Orthodox church and you ask them, what did you notice? Like, you know, first some visitors, like, oh, what, did, what did you notice that was kind of unusual? That's kind of a distinctive feature. People would say typically two things. People sign themselves like 40 times in the wrong way, the things you know, a lot, right? Whenever people say that they're talking about the Trinity, you know, people do this many times. That's a feature, right, that people notice. It's strange. Things. The second is that uh, there's icons, right? Some people like them. Some people think they're idols. They, they, they're just horrible, you know. Like there's a... Uh, uh, a Calvinist group uh, out of Pennsylvania living here, and they wrote an article on orthodoxy called Repugnant Beauty. But the, the trinity of the Orthodox Church and the icons is one and the same. It's one and the same understanding of, of the universe. It goes like this. The Orthodox Church there is one God because there is. This is your, the exam part. We get ready. There is one God because there is. One right, church. Yes. No. Oh. I mean, it's not bad. <laughs> the reverse would be true. Oh. In the creed says, "I believe in one God, the, the Father." Who is the one God? The Father. Okay. There's one God because there's one Father. The Father, read, read uh, these Eulas, by the way, you'll see. The Father, as it is person, and it is I am, is the cause, the cause, the origin of everything and everyone, including His only begotten Son and Holy Spirit. The Son and the Spirit have an origin. Most Christians will think you're, you're, you're a, a heretic for saying that. Of course, we're right, but we're trying to tell them. You know, that's, the, that's the biblical teaching. Now, the Son and the Spirit don't have an, an origin or a beginning in time. Right? They are uncreated, they're timeless. But their existence is derived from the Father saying, I am. Therefore, the fathers would say, when Jesus says, the Father is greater than I am, what does he mean? He means... Greater than time? He says, John 14, 20, the Father is greater than I am. What is, why does he say that? Because he's a man right now, and the Father is God in heaven, so the Father is greater than he is? No, that's not. No. Because the Father is uncaused. The Father is uncaused. is underived. And that's a unique feature. And that's the biblical 
Old Testament, early church teaching. It's not Arianism. In fact, Zizulas explains this, and as you know, we have to say, we're not Arians. What are Arians? People who say that God was alone, the Father, for a long, long time, like in Star Wars, and one day, he creates but only begotten the Holy Spirit. In time. That's a heresy. We say God, the Father, is always with His only begotten Son and Holy Spirit. Right? They're all three uncreated, but only one is uncaused. And therefore, and therefore, all worship, Atriya, is offered in the Spirit through the Son who is an icon to the source, the Father. That's our, that's our life. Live in the Spirit, and through Christ, who is an icon, we offer all praise and glory to God the Father. That's the Orthodox life. It's iconic. Right? It's iconic. It says that God the Father is accessed, worshipped through His icon. Who is? Jesus. That's right. right? Colossians 1.10, He is the icona, the icon of the invisible God. So all Christians worship an icon, even though they don't like the idea, right? What is Jesus? But so the, the icons in the church are a constant reminder that we need to relate with everything and everyone iconically. I have to relate with James, because through him I can glorify God. Or I can use James like an object, right? it just ends here. You consume people, things, or you really live iconically. All things come from the Father, through the Son, receiving the Holy Spirit, right? and then you return it that way. So the Trinity and icons are unique features of the church, visibly, and they are the defining, the defining doctrines. Now you could say, well, you could have this theology and have no images at all. Sure, I said the church could have said, well, we won't have any images whatsoever. But that would be a problem. Because in fact, there were images in the Old Testament. It wasn't zero. Even the Jews had synagogues with some, some images. At least angels were in the temple, you know, the ark. And then, how do, and then you live in a world where there's everywhere posters, images, right? And then the only image that really mattered couldn't be portrayed or used. So the church wisely in wisdom said, we cannot do, we can't do this. We must allow images, but we're going to do it this way. We will not really promote statues. They remind us of the pagan gods of Greece and Rome. And they don't have that pastoral theology. I mean, and the statue kind of confines things, you know, I think, so, so it's not going to be flat, be flat, and we will treat them the way we treat living Christians. We kiss living Christians, right? Holy kiss, as we should, right? So we're going to kiss icons. We kiss the cross, we kiss the gospel, we're going to kiss icons. We're not going to worship them, but we're going to treat them with reverence. The way the flag is treated, for example, in American culture. So that's, those are two distinctives, right? The, the, the way we see the Trinity, the way we see uh, the role of icons as this great, it's a great theological message to us. Um, let me see if I have any time to end 255, 10 minutes. Any questions about any of this so far? Do you agree? What I said so far? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I won't ask Mark, but uh, right. So that does that right? Any questions? Would you say that the Protestant churches are part of the Catholic Church? No. No. If they don't have a Eucharist or a... so, first of all, the Catholic Church has no parts. Huh? Think about it this way, okay? Well, would you say that they are the whole church? Though? Well, I would say this, that the church is made manifest in fullness, okay, when conditions are met. 
if those things aren't met, you have a more and more defective manifestation. Give you an example of this the, this hologram concept. You know, there's you know what a hologram is, mm -hmm. right? It's it's a piece of film, kind of could be big. They've encoded an image on it in a very special way. You you beam a laser. You can use a little tiny pen laser, and it comes out the entire shape, right? The apple, for example. A hologram is the same root in Greek, right? Hologram, Catholic, same root, same word. Right? But if you take the film, you cut it in half, and then you do it again, the whole object appears. Now you take your film, you fold it, you've got four pieces of the film, you take one for one fourth, you, you, you do this, you still get the whole image. There is the whole in every part. Because the encoding has the features to do this. But the more you know, the, the smaller you cut, it's more fuzzy, right? more, so it's less, less clear picture. I would say that to, for the church to be there with assurance, the same assurance that you have, say, you travel to Israel, you got an American passport, which is legitimate, it's valid, you got a real stamp from the real embassy, you show up there, you have, a, you have objective assurance that you're going to be led, right? Not about how you feel, you know, it's, it's an objective fact of your assurance you're going to be led. Right? So I would say that when these features are, are less and less there, you have less and less objective assurance that you are uniting yourself to Christ or in harmony with, with His will. Maybe you're even thwarting His will. I'll give you an example uh, of that. I think, that's my view, that uh, the risen Lord is alive today, lest we forget, we believe that, right? We're, he's alive, He rules, so He has a will for His people. He has a will. In every territory, say, humble, He has a will. So I would, if I could force people to do something, right, I would like people to, to do this. And I would say his will, since the early church, is that all the people of God gather in one place on the Lord's Day. Mm -hmm. Under one bishop, with his presbyters, his deacons, right, the people there, with one loaf, one loaf, it's important in the Bible, with one cup, one chalice, right? and, and all the people come in this, in this, in this one <coughs> worship, right? And everybody communes in the one cup, the one bread, and experience unity with one another and with Christ. So the reverse of that, for example, would be when people gather together and there's no even bread or, or wine. That is not his will. Or when people say, well, we're going to have four services on Sunday, uh, one with rock music for the youth, uh, one at 10, 15 with organ for the 50 plus crowd, where you're using the church to divide people. That's against the will of Christ. Right? Now, a lot of people do this, uh, they don't realize what they're doing. Right? Uh, that's, that's a recurring theme in the Bible. Forgive them, they don't know what they do. Right? But, this, but if we know, we want to support it to use that, uh, this term, the Lord's agenda. His agenda is for this to take place. Now, are we as Orthodox doing it perfectly? No. No. But um, I don't think there's any defect that is fatal. It's not perfect because we have two bishops in San Francisco. That's not, that's not right. We have to have one bishop in one city here. But we have three bishops in San Francisco. So that's wrong. They're aware of it, their knowledge is wrong, but that's a defect. A defect, right? I'll give examples of, of severe defects. Uh, so take the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Say, even in France, where I'm from. I go to France, I go to Montpellier, it's my town. This has been a church since, you know, since Christians <coughs> came in the 300s. So historically, the Catholic Church in Montpellier was the Catholic Church Right? Attached to Rome. Over the, over the, the centuries, the defects 
that are common to the churches that are joined to Rome have contaminated the church in Montpellier, where I, where I go. Right? What kinds of defects would those be here? Well, for example, in the, it was the will, I think, of, of, of God, the apostles, to actually baptize, to immerse, to baptize, to immerse. So it was proper to immerse children three times. That was the, the apostolic way. And then you would anoint them, or you would confirm them right away. And then you would commune them. Right? That's, that's the proper way to do it. Now, in the Latin West, or the church of Montpellier where I go, uh, like my parents, and I'm in, in, their, in their territory, so to speak, right? there's some serious defects there. They baptize by sprinkling, then they don't, they don't uh, confirm or commune the child. Right? Um, they wait, sometimes a long time, until the bishop shows up to confirm. Well, first, they have first communion, so someone communes even before being confirmed, which is a reversal of what was meant to be. And then finally you get confirmed. Right? Um, and then there's the, 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 especially since 69, there's defects in the liturgy, in the form. The intent, the language, you know. So defects accumulate more and more to the point where at some point you don't really know with what assurance you know, people are actually in harmony with Christ's will. Now, I'll take the city of Rome as an example, okay? The city of Rome, there's been a bishop there for 2,000 years, right? The Pope of Rome. The Orthodox Church never said, we're going to fix the problem. We're going to send one of our guys to Rome and leave Bishop of Rome. Done. It doesn't work that way. Right? The Orthodox Church has said, well, we, there's a bishop in Rome over there. Things have gone kind of wacko, you know. And the answer isn't to send one of our people to, 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 to Rome and to claim to be the Bishop of Rome. It doesn't work that way. Rome 